So good evening and welcome. My name is David True. Those of you who have attended our events before know me well, I'm sure. Um, and I wanted to welcome you to this, uh, what promises to be a really fascinating event tonight. Um, I uh, NIPE, as those of you who know us probably know, we've been doing events uh, probably, uh, NIPE was founded in 2006, really kicked into year in about 2010, and have been doing regular events both in person and since the pandemic, virtual uh, since then regularly. Uh, so we usually put these on about once a month with a couple of, you know, uh, holiday months. We don't usually do things. So um, I hope that you enjoy this event tonight uh, and uh, can appreciate the kind of uh, uh, meeting of minds and exchange of ideas that we try to promote here at NIPE. So I welcome you to this. Before I get further along, I'd like to thank Further Advisory, who sponsors us and makes this all possible. And then a couple of housekeeping points. Um, if you've got questions, please use the chat and we will for filter those in so they'll be part of the Q&A that comes up. There will be a Q&A at the end. And if you're not on the panel or a moderator, please turn off your camera and microphone. Now, at the end of the actual discussion, there will be, a, there will be breakout sessions where the magic of Zoom will put each of us into a small room for 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll get a chance to meet and speak with people in a smaller, in a, in a smaller context than we did, um, you know, in the in the in the actual panel discussion. So you can actually have a different kind of interaction with the people who've been on the call, both the attendees and the panelists. Um, and that's about it. So we've got a fantastic panel, a really interesting topic, and uh, I very, very much, I'm very much appreciate you all joining us tonight. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Alfredo Saria, who will be our moderator tonight. And um, uh, with, I'll uh, put myself, as I suggested for everyone else, I'll take myself off camera and put myself on mute. So very much enjoy the discussion. And I look forward to seeing you again at the end of the discussion when we begin the breakout rooms. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. So I'm Alfredo Saria. I help FIs and weather resource fintechs solve actual problems that deliver customer success and maximize value creation. My favorite part of the NIPE events is helping like-minded executives like you guys connect the dots in payments. So that's a little bit about me. This panel is a result of a NIPE survey conducted late last year. Over 100 people answered, and they listed how to embed it, how embedded finance can enhance business banking services for SMBs as a top two key theme. Now, I would like to introduce, I would like to have the panel introduce themselves. Uh, Anthony, would like to start? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Pekulik. I am the head of banking as a service and cards at Crossover Bank. Um, I've been in the uh, cards and payments industry for over 22 years now. Worked at various uh, places such as Citi, uh, MasterCard, ADP along my way. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to a topic that I have a lot of passion for. Uh, Tom Rata. Hi everyone, oh, you got the name right. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, okay, everyone, I'm Tom Rata. Uh, I'm the head of operations with uh, Patriot Bank. Uh, we're a sponsor bank with a lot of uh, commercial prepaid, commercial debit and, and, and credit programs. Uh, personally, I've been in the, the payments space uh, for about 19 years with roles from uh, like a, a net spend in, in marketing and have evolved into product and operations kinds of roles. I'm a payments guy, as, uh, as they put it. So looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks for being here. Uh, Ian, what are our next? Yeah, hey, everybody. My name is Ian Benton. I work for Javelin Strategy and Research. Um, I head up our small business banking and payments practice. So I come from the market research side. So, um, you know, we probably have most of the top 50 banks as our clients, as well as a number of digital platform um, providers. Uh, so hopefully I can provide some perspective on uh, what business owners are doing and what uh, kind of maybe traditional banks are thinking about the embedded finance space. So, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. And last but not least, uh, Tom Priori. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, Tom Priori, I'm the chairman and CEO at Priority Technology Holdings. Um, we're a uh, uh, we're the fourth largest uh, non-bank acquiring business, or I guess payments business in the U.S., and um, manage a platform that uh, that really has been driving towards 
I'll call it the convergence of payments and banking, which is what I think about as embedded finance. Um, just shy of 900 million of revenue for the upcoming year, a couple hundred of EBITDA. Um, so it's a operating at scale and excited to kind of talk about what we think is the future, you know, of, of where, of where payment should go, which is, um, you know, along a, a payments and banking convergence. So thanks everybody for taking the time. Wonderful. So uh, as you can see, everybody here has a great perspective on payments and embedded finance. So I would like to begin with setting the stage a little bit here. Uh, instead of talking of why embedded finance, we want to focus on how it can enhance business banking services. So embedded finance is one of these themes or terms that have become a buzzword. Um, we want to demystify it a little bit. So I would like, uh, before we go there, um, a definition that we had in the past that we have kind of shared is how it's integrating financial services into non-financial websites, mobile apps, and business processes. And I think the umbrella term glosses over lending, banking, insurance, and many others. So I believe Ian had a nice chart that shows uh, some trends in the industry. Yeah, so just a little background here. We um, collect data every year from small business owners and they have revenues between 100,000 and, and 10 million. And we just got our data back um, for, for this year, uh, a few weeks ago. And I just put it together against the past uh, five years of data just to kind of show how starkly or how quickly this is um, happening. So we collect whether or not they have a, a financial product at uh, any of the probably top seven big tech companies. As you see on here, PayPal, QuickBooks, and Square, but also we collect uh, Amazon, Apple, Shopify, um, and Stripe. Uh, so as you can see, I mean, PayPal, QuickBooks, and Square are uh, number one, two, and three. And this is not necessarily just using these folks for payment processing, but also using them for credit products, even checking accounts, using them for cash flow analysis and digital uh, financial management tools. At this point, 73% of small businesses in the U.S. have a, a, some sort of financial relationship um, with a non-bank big tech company. And that doesn't even count the you know hundreds of ISVs that they may have a relationship um, that we're going to be talking with as well. So I think we just wanted to, to kind of show this to show how quickly this has been happening over the past few years, um, how quickly business owner behaviors and attitudes towards uh, this towards non-bank um, financial services um, has, has changed. Thanks a lot, Ian. So I think that's a good segue now to, uh, I would like Tom Priori to shed some light on how the definition has evolved in the recent years and what are the key components today? Yeah, um, I appreciate that, Alfredo. Um, the, um, you know, I guess I, if I would start off, I see a lot of faces on this that I'll just say appear to be around my age. Right. And I think we can all remember, you know, um, I I kind of I don't want to say I scoff a little bit, but I find the idea of embedded fans kind of um, amusing in a way because um, sort of this has been around for a long time. Um, probably all, you know, our parents back in the day, like bought things on layaway because maybe they didn't have all the money they needed for, you know, Christmas presents. Right. So. Um, but is that embedded finance? You know, when I went, you know, when you went and bought their their first appliances for their home, you know, did they finance it at the point of sale? Probably, right? Put it on terms. So, you know, I think this whole notion has been around. What's really been unlocked, and I think it's been a byproduct of this convergence of software and payments, and is that embedding these features, right? Just making transactional activity, you know, simpler has you know, started to uh, um, drive, you know, this convergence, you know, the the, bun the, the rebundling of services that were, you know, uh, I think for many, many years, just delivered in a, in a more specialized fashion, right? Whether it's buy now, pay later or lending or banking features, you know, and we really see this, this idea of embedded finance just I kind of described this as convergence of payments and banking and and creating that experience in a bundled, you know, a bundled application. Um, so, you know, we think it's it's um, 
actually probably one of the more exciting times to be, you know, in, in payments that's come along um, because of the, the desire. I think what you're seeing in that chart, which is really compelling when you think about the numbers, that's, that's what small merchants want. You know, if you talk to small businesses, 95% of maybe quite, not quite 95, this is according to Barclays, 92% of small businesses don't, don't like their bank or dissatisfied with their bank. It's probably a better way to say it. Why? Well, they don't get lending products. They don't get credit. So they're seeking out other places to get it. You know, and the, the thing is, they're probably not getting it, not because banks don't want to, but it's very, very inefficient for banks to provide that. So I'd love to hear from somebody who's kind of in, has been at the larger banks that are just, it's a, it's a cost, it's cost inefficient to solve them, which I think is really where the big opportunity lies for, you know, businesses like, like ours, uh, because we can sort of make the delivery much less expensive, turn ourselves into virtualized bank branches and start delivering these solutions embedded in the other things we do. I, I, I agree with that. And uh, Tom Rata, do you have additional thoughts on that, on that topic? Yeah, I, I, by the way, I totally agree that I, I sort of chuckle at the concept of embedded finance. It's, 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 it's not a new, it's a new word. It's a new phrase, uh, relatively speaking. Um, but the, the, the concept is, 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 has always been around. To me, it's, it's just a simple concept of how do we solve problems through payments, um, and. You know, banking is a service. That's, everyone loves that buzzword these days. Embedded finance. The, to me, they're both effectively the same thing. Whereas embedded finance itself is more focused on. I'm a if a, a business where its core business is not payments. How do we use payments to help solve those problems to generate, uh, generate efficiency? Accept payments. You know, think back. You know. A few decades ago, Tom, I don't know where we are in the age spectrum. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess we're somewhere in the in the area. But back in Good back work. in the day, yeah. the the I don't, I don't know, I don't know. But the um, the uh, adding a cart to a website, you know, at some point that was a pretty novel idea. Embedding financial services products into a core business for an online retailer, um, where that online retailer doesn't have to be payments experts doesn't have to be have all of the 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 due diligence and the integration into the into the banking system of 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 the country they can use the right the right payments companies the right parties in order to enhance their their core business and bank banking as a service is effectively those those core businesses that are built around payments to provide solutions um, that uh, that make the world a better place. And so Tom, you like you end on Ian's slide, I saw, you know, the squares and the, 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 the QuickBooks of the world, those are big, large companies, but I think it's important to remember there's a lot of very niche solutions that can apply across a number of industries, across a, a number of different kinds of use cases that maybe aren't household names that aren't uh, uh, ubiquitous terms that, that are also coming to light and that are, are creative, uh, creative solutions to the, to the banking world. Thanks for that. And go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, no doubt. I mean, look at the, the day, right? We, um, a lot of these tools like require a cooperative bank, right? I mean, you guys are yep. one of them, you know, Anthony is a, another bank platform that like, it, it, you know, if, if you're not there providing the FinTech with a, you know, with, with the components they don't have, which is a banking license, mm -hmm. right? Well, this is not getting off the ground, right? So, um, but Anthony, it just, it looked to me like you had something you might want to add. So I just want to give you a minute. No, I, you both, uh, I'm going to call you the Toms. The Toms <laughs> making great points, right? It's, it's, it's at the end of the day, call it buzzwords, whatever you want. I agree. What, why it's important to talk about embedded finance or however we talk about it is that we are at a point, and I think you touched upon this, where technology is fi finally meeting operations, is finally meeting banking, right? We have so many offerings, and I call it creativity of existing rails, 
that are being used where you can provide so many solutions and we'll get into more discussion on it. There's so many different solutions that are out there right now. So, so for me, I agree. This is the, if you're trying to do something in the B2B space and whatever it is, this is probably the best time because yeah, there's slightly less options out there maybe, but right now people are investing. So there are folks investing in this space. They're finally realizing the B2B space is really a great space for growth. It's it's less, let me call it BS, you know, in terms of the mm-hmm. consumer stuff you got to deal with, right? Because these are small businesses. They tend to spend, they need solutions. And frankly, they're not as picky, right? Though they should be, right? So, so I do think like all in all, like we've hit the point where this to me is going to boom. It, it's going to continue to boom. I think we've seen it boom. And, and I think that, you know, again, as a bank and being in this space, specifically in fintech, we, we definitely are seeing the demand. It's, it's now overtaken consumer, right, for the first time, I would say, in the last year. You know, there was a question posed in the chat that said, what has changed? Like, hey, yeah, different, you know, kind of same concept, different nomenclature, but what's changed about it? And look, I, in my view, the thing that's changed is it's speed. Right. This is it's there's there's just elegant solutions out there now that are fast to implement. And I think the other thing that's been a big change is the manner in which it's now done has unlocked sources of capital that were not present before. So it has it has started to attract non-bank sources of capital. Um deep and, and actually, and larger, cheaper sources of capital. So I think that's been the real, real change. And look, I, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out, right? You follow the money. Following the money is like a pretty good formula in business. Well, you're now seeing like a money um, flood into it's like where its utility exists, right? So commercial paper conduits or bank, you know, warehouse facilities. They're taking their slug. The hedge funds are finding theirs. You know, the the equity players are, you know, finding, you know, where to um where to be supportive in these capital structures. I think that's that that's been the most recent change that, you know, is is you know is going to be a catalyst for growth. Thank you. And that's a great uh, overview of the landscape of embedded finance nowadays. Uh, I think one comment that I hear is about speed and is uh, we were talking about before and banks, traditional banks becoming dumb pipes. And the question is, how can those banks avoid becoming those dumb pipes? Should they avoid that? Uh, I don't know if Ian had some thoughts on that. Yeah, so I mean, I'm coming from maybe a traditional banker's perspective and really they are starting to come around to Hey, our businesses are going elsewhere because, you know, maybe we haven't offered payment acceptance or maybe we haven't offered cash flow analysis or the right credit products and things like that. So I think there's this fear amongst the kind of traditional bank and credit union industry that are serving small businesses. And people are suddenly kind of waking up and saying, hey, we kind of need to bring some of these things back into um, our platform and really try to recenter ourselves in the lives um, of our customers. So. It's kind of like it's almost like reverse embedded finance. It's like it's like embedding non-financial services into financial services. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that more later. Maybe that's outside of the uh, of um, the current focus. But uh, I do think that the uh, kind of traditional banking space is saying, "Hey, what are some of the things? Why why are, why have we seen such uh, what we call silent churn, which is where you keep your checking account at one place but are going elsewhere for every other product." Why have we seen so much of that? Why are the uh, the tech companies poaching so much of it? And how can we respond? Got it. Well, that makes sense. Uh, before we go to the use case study, the case study section of best practices, just one key, key thing here is um, the B2B versus B2C focus. Uh, what approaches are you seeing? In particular, I think we talk about a payable working capital cash flow. Taking up taking up your company's hat for a moment. Any any approaches you're seeing in the market? Maybe Anthony or Tom are. Yeah, I mean, um, so a, a couple things I would say. You know, what's what I what I've been seeing. Again, the question of innovation or creativity is it's all for your own 
fake, right? So let's put it aside. We now have um, organizations, companies that are really driving solutions for very specific things and seeing success in doing that. You know, in the past, I think there was, you know, you go get yourself a commercial checking account and then figure out what you're going to do with there, right? From a top bank. Now you're having solutions built specifically for expense management. You have solutions built for the creative community, right? And their unique things that they have, or, you know, in the entertainment space, right? There's solutions specifically to not only pay people in many countries where you're filming, but also to deal with the tax situations. And so if you, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I think that you've definitely seen an, an, an increase in the, in the focus and stretch of kind of what, what the traditional rails plus the new rails have brought plus the creativity of, of the startup community for the most part. And some, you know, some major tech companies that like the Intuits of the world, of course, and others, right. Coming together and really driving what have been profitable solutions for them to specifically address a key need of, of an SMB or a corporate. So, so, and for me, that that's the consumer effect, right. You know, consumer has always gotten, you always had the creativity there. The money was there from a venture capital perspective for a long time. Right. And you saw all these, you know, neo banks and everything come about where the commercial space was kind of left stagnant for a long time. It's now reversed. And I think people are starting to pump the money here, as I said earlier. And, and I think that now, like I said, if you're looking for specific solutions, you have multiple players um, that can provide you with with those tools. And that is, again, something that has not been around, let's call it the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, and I, I I'm remarked at some of the the flexibility of some of the the solutions that come out there that that have come out in order to make give control in all the right places for them for think about businesses that are doing expense management where I might have ten different layers of employees and they can have their own individual expense accounts with their own individual cards that can be turned on and off with intuitive interfaces with with a lot of flexibility to be able to manage what they spend, what they spend on, uh, you know, down to, we've got, uh, you know, think uh, pay with privacy is a, a, a good example of that, where I can, I, one of my employees needs to go buy lunch at Jimmy John's across the street. I can enable them to have a card that can only be used at Jimmy John's across the street. Um, and then every kind of think about the granularity that it takes to be able to manage use a specific use case like that, and then be able to provide the flexibility for any of a number of other use cases across the expense the the, the expense management point of view. And not only is it providing that level of um, control, but you've also got transparent. You've got a, a variety of transparency and tracking that. Um, wouldn't have existed before. Um, the thing I'm particularly interested to see how some of the innovation in in, ca in the cash flow world is going to evolve is as as Fed now and and real time payments continue to catch on. Uh, you know, today or in in previous, you know, even just a couple of years ago, you know, real time requires this real complex cash flow management going on behind the scenes that that takes up that can suck up a lot of capital that can require a lot of oversight and intensive care in order to make it happen and with the the development of of the the, the fed now concepts real time means real time um and that frees up capital that frees up a number of of uh of or that uh, cuts out a lot of the the baloney it's a forum. I'll, I'll keep my language uh, clean. It cuts out a lot of the, the baloney that, that goes on behind the scenes and that can be air prone and, you know, keeps, keeps folks like, like Anthony and I up at night. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Tom. And, and I think that's a, that's a good uh, segue in terms of regulation. Um, as we know, in other countries, Brazil, India, regulation has driven innovation or launching new solutions. Uh, Fed now is not a mandate here in the U.S., but how are you seeing the changing regulatory environment in the U.S. affecting embedded finance, especially as it comes to open banking, a partnership between bank and, banks and fintechs? I don't know if Tom Priori wants to share some thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, maybe, um, and I'll, I thought it'd be interesting to to have 
Anthony lead off on this one, just because like he'll look at it from a bank's perspective, kind of living that dynamic and dealing with regulators. And because I've certainly seen, I'll just call it the benefits of that from the fintech perspective. Um, but Anthony, let me let you go By first. All means. Yeah, Anthony, you go first. No, no, of course. I mean, it's, and again, interestingly enough, right, it's uh, fintech banking, right? I mean, in particular, right, and I don't think it's a surprise, the regulatory environment has become challenging. And I think that, you know, we knew that going in across river, you know, we've been planning for this for a while. It's, it's not, it's not a big surprise because right now what's happening is, is that there's a lot of scrutiny in terms of like the players and, and really it comes down to a couple of things in my opinion. Number one, it's, it's the quality of the monitoring and data that you have. And what, what are you actually, are you actually looking at it? Are you actually doing something about it? I think that that tends to slip a lot of people up, right? And and what happens is when you have multiple components involved, you have a processor, you have a bank, you have you know program manager, you have like four or five parties. It's really difficult for banks to have to oversee because at the end of the day, we're responsible for everything, no matter if if we do it or not, right? So in that model, as things have gotten more complex, of course, things have gotten more complex in the regulation. So so really, you know, from a banking perspective, number one. Though there is a lot of scrutiny, right? We still feel across river, and I think many and Tom are may agree. We f- still feel there's a there's you know we feel ready for it. We have to be prepared for it. It does require more resource. It requires more automation. It requires you to really be on top of it. And to me, one of the biggest aspects of it is really having direct client relationships. It's one of the things that I emphasize for those that are looking for banks. Be at a place where you know who your bank is, you have a relationship with them, whether it be contractually or not, because if you don't, then you are literally putting yourself at risk because you're playing a game of telephone, right, with third party providers. So so I I think that that in itself, right, is going to present challenges to many of our sisters and brother banks where many have decided not to remain in the space because there is a resource constraint. Um, and those of us that are there, we understand what it is because we've built out the efficiencies and understand the market. So it's going to definitely lead to less options, but I think the options will be better quality. And I think we will be better for it because, you know, we're going to be on top of our game um, and more so than ever, right, to make sure that we're providing the support we need. Yeah, and yeah. Kind of, I'll just say echoing on that from a from a fintech perspective, who's a, I'll just call it a, that we're a partner of two banks or banks are our partner. Um, you know, we've kind of, we had been positioning for this environment of the belief that regulatory scrutiny would come. Um, smaller providers, I'll tell you, they were very tech-based. So they were tech-heavy, compliance, regulatory light. We're just going to get devastated. And, that, and that's kind of what happened. So we're, you know, we actually have money transmission licenses nationwide. We actually, we want regulation. We want a rigor around operators in the space because most of the folks actually don't meet a quality of rigor that will make them viable. Uh, You know, it's just, that's just reality because it does take, you know, we we, sort of the, the, the term resources has been mentioned, right? And we think resources, we we often think people, but or expertise, right? But you actually need money, right? You need the resources to whether it's regulatory capital from a bank's perspective or you know, um, you know, operating expense capability from a fintech's perspective to build out the systems, to you know, to run a compliance department that is the equivalent of a bank, like. I think the table stakes for being in this space, they're elevating. And that's probably, you know, we think a really good thing because it is going to take out some parties it already has, right? I'm sure everyone here has seen the headlines um, around, you know, fast companies either, you know, changing their business model or going out altogether because their bank pulled back or what have you. You know, that's that we're still probably in the middle innings of that. Um you know, and those that have good tech will find partners and those that don't will, you know, will probably wash out, but it's probably what the, the market needs, you know, candidly, so that, you know, we have some, 
um, really well capitalized, well resourced, you know, parties in the space that just, you know, operate with in a framework that the regulators are going to be satisfied with, you know, um, because the good thing is, and this is where I think the big opportunity is as well, because all that regulatory scrutiny is increasing at banks, you know what? Banks are probably in it, you know, we there's a there's this belief that maybe banks are dumb. Oh, no, very very far from it. They're they're very, very aware of where their profitability point is on their customer base. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're managing to. And I think the opportunity for folks like us is, hey, we could actually fill that aggregation. So very efficiently, they can interface with one big counterparty that's aggregated all these smaller ones and done it in a framework that can be executed on cost efficiently because it's it doesn't have the same regulatory burden. But then when it faces the bank, it meets the requirements of, of the bank. You know, and that that's how I think this, you know, this this will evolve really successful. And I think I think you guys are hitting the head on that the nail on the head in terms of there's gonna be an evolution and there will be a few who will survive with a good servicing model. Um one comment that I heard from a customer recently was that you're only as good as your weakest third party partner. And when it comes to integration, uh what are the main challenges, whether technical operational in, in a very embedded finance into SMB's workflows and systems. <clears throat> Maybe Tom Rata. Yeah, I I think that's a a, a keen a keen observation. Um that I mean the from the bank's point of view, you know, everything's trending towards access and control. Um and where the bank isn't necessarily going to be the the end-to-end -end technology platform that the bank's going to do what what the bank's good at, which is oversight. And uh, I I think an element that can that any any good bank can do is is also an element of coaching. Um, you know how how do we enable the fintech partners that 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 we all work with to to do what they do? Not we don't want to diminish the innovation and some of the creativity that comes out of the the the, the fintech space, um, but at the same time, and, and enable it in a way that that doesn't create further problems down the road. Um, I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but. Um, that, you know, the, I think it was Anthony that said something earlier that there's definitely an element of, of, of quality over quantity. Um, when you talk about the, the FinTech, the, the FinTech partners, um, but to that, to that same end, there's, you gotta, there's, there's, there's leaps of faith that, 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 that can happen, but it requires partners that, that treat the bank as, as an active partner. Uh, and not just the bank that tells them what to do um, and or the bank that tells them what not to do, you know, if, if, if you will. I, think I, uh, I couldn't call. agree. Yeah. No, I'm nodding my head because it's, it's so true. I, I call it the solutioning factor, right? I right. think, you know, I tell my team, if you're having a conversation and you're just shaking your head, yes, with, with, with whoever you're talking to and you're not, potentially asking questions or even pushing back or offering solutions, right? That's not, we're not adding value, right? We're creating a problem that in my opinion has existed where we've had others and I don't want to throw any to say in this space, unfortunately, because of what we've seen, just agree to do whatever someone tells them to do, right? Because they just want to throw, you know, they want deposits, they want volume, they want revenue, right? That that That's part of what the business strategy was. I think Banks are now going to play a more pivotal role, but we as a bank have to take that role seriously. We can't just be a no bank. We can't just be sitting there and just, you know, coming up with excuses of, of why we shouldn't be doing things. We should be the ones helping to drive alongside our fintech partners, right? And others who we work with, right? Alongside of them and be, be a, a, a key um, component of where we need to go. And I think that that model, the model we have had where, 
a bank is kind of a vendor, as I always use, use the term vendor versus a partner, they're on the side, hey, they just, they're holding my money. That's all I need them for, right? That, that, that whole situation, if that's what your bank is, then, you know, you have a problem, right? And, and that's not a good place to be. So, so I think the, the other thing is on when you talk about integrations and things, the challenges that we face, right? Because we do have to uh, collect data or get, you know, we constantly have to do daily, monthly, weekly, like all kinds of stuff. Everything from application data on fair lending on credit card applications to, you know, we need to get transaction monitoring. Though you, you go through the list of stuff. I mean, now it's like you know extensive. The issue presents, you know, you're working with a partner who's who could be more modern, right? You know, we're a modern bank, so we've you know we're API focused. It's great, but then you work with those that don't. They have batch files, and then you're you're trying to how do you integrate these things? And then you're taking data, you're manipulating it, if you will, because you have to put it in a certain profile because your teams are looking at it that way. I mean, don't, that's where all these things go wrong, right? And so so really. The standards have changed and in a way modernization has helped but in a way it actually hurts because a lot of our industry is still kind of working on you know 1980s technology right so so it really depends on kind of like you know how you're set up and what you're doing but as i said earlier the biggest thing that that people forget about is beyond operations is so key for this business but the biggest thing is the data access to the data is going to save you if you don't you're screwed that's it plain and simple Thanks a lot, Anthony. Uh, we have a question in the chat box from Tom Le and our Tom, Tom Lehman. Does the U.S. have too many different regulatory authorities? And if so, does that in on itself lead to challenges for both new entrants as well as legacy ones? Anybody want to weigh in that? Can I offer a thought before the bankers do? Because I don't know. If we have <laughs> I don't know if we have too many. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we have too many, but I would say the ones we have often don't understand what they're regulating. That's that my observation. And look, I, you know, you can, you can look at every crisis, right. And we've just had a, you know, I won't say we had a crisis, but we had some hiccups, right. In the banking segment that, you know, created, you know, a level of, of, you know, uncertainty um, and, and trust, you know, a reduction in trust, but, it's like the reaction to it is, I think it's so often driven politically as it rather than, uh, you know, like uh, intellectually that like that to me seems more of the, the dynamic that just as a country, as a industry, like we need to overcome is like intellectual response as opposed to emotional, emotionally driven response. And then, you know, it's 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 hard to have really good regulators in place that, you know, like given the staff they have, how do you regulate the number of banks that we have? You know, and things like that. So I'm I'm curious how, what you guys have seen, like just in like how is regulate how's the regulation regulatory interaction changed, you know? I'll I'll start that because Tom, I, I appreciate that I've I've been at the bank the Patriots, the first bank I've worked at. I've 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 been here a less than a year. So you're one of the first people to 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 call me as authoritarily a banker. I, I don't know if I should be excited <laughs> or not, but as a as a as a normal uh, fintech guy. I don't know if I can answer the question, are there too many? Certainly not going to get in, in, into the, the the politics of the matter. What's always been fascinating to me and is even more clear being on the bank side is it doesn't seem like the regulators are on the same page with each other. Um, and the, the I guess you sort of presume there's a predictability factor into what's going to what, what's going to come up in any given uh, any given engagement with with the, the the regulators and my experience, you know, I'm, I'm more on the operations side, not not ter not getting in in the room necessarily with with them, but there's there's just an element of of unpredictability that just doesn't feel healthy out of a um, out of a, uh, an, an, an oversight entity. Um, uh, out of those kinds of experience, yeah. but I, I'd, I'd love. Anthony's uh, response to that too. Yeah, I, I think for me, I, the question of how many, I agree. I, I don't know if that's really what it is. 
at the end of the day, what we all want is clarity, right? Sometimes, whether we want to hear it or not, rules are rules, fine, you know, and I think that that's part of it. The interpretive nature of what we have to do on a daily basis, like everything we do, I think presents issues because, you know, we can talk, we can have five of our banks get together, really smart people, right? Compliance people. I know folks across and they will literally look at the same language and come up with five different conclusions, right? As to what is okay and what isn't. And I think that that's part of the problem. You know, I, I do, you know, I think, and I'm not going to say whether folks are educated, I don't want to get into whether the folks are educated or not, though I do think having more um, ability to interact in this way in an educational manner, sitting down and actually understanding what the customer is, needs are and what they're doing and what we're trying to do, it, that seems to be more productive. And I think that that could be a more of a, a, of a better approach than kind of coming in, gotcha, you know, like after, and it's like, oh, you know, like, okay, gotcha, what? I don't know. And, you know, and I think that that's, that whole thing has to change. I think it should, and I'm hopeful it can, because then it'll be productive because I do believe we do need some regulation. Of course, we need to put some, we have to put some rules on this, right. To protect um, consumers, protect businesses, but, but I want it to be productive and not just, like I said, we're scared, everyone running scared and not knowing or, or guessing as to what things are. I think that that presents challenges. Great. Yeah, totally thanks, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts on that question. Um, we're talking about SMBs. In general, I think earlier, I I heard about small entrepreneurs, freelancers, the economic workers. So when it comes to use cases, what are you seeing that are really nailing it to serve those uh, that segment of the startup uh, entrepreneurs? Maybe, I don't know if Ian, you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I don't know if any of you guys are aware, but I think something like a third of the U.S. workforce is freelancing now. A lot of that's going to be moonlighters. It's like 64 million, though. It's quite a bit. And a lot of these folks are sitting on consumer banking platforms. So as mentioned, we, um, you know, we collect data on businesses between, between 100,000 and 10 million. So on the lower end of that, we get a ton of sole props in our data. Um up to like 30 or 40 percent of them say that they're on they're operating on a, on a consumer banking platform but they're also operating on like a personal credit card spending on a personal credit card um, they may be getting consumer loans against their house and things like that so um it's it's traditionally i think been a pretty difficult segment to serve but it's one that's growing um really quickly um so if you think about kind of what their pain points are the biggest one is going to be uh, probably payment acceptance and there's so many different areas of that there's kind of the invoicing to electronic payment acceptance that you have to handle. There's like the, in, you know, the invoice creation itself, sending it to their customer and receiving a payment. There's like the invoice sent over, you know, through the mail or over email that comes in, comes back as a check. There's card payments. And we're seeing um, actually a really interesting trend with a number of the banks building card acceptance directly within the banking app. So you can just go up and tap to pay um, on the phone, which I think is a, a great way to kind of bring that back within uh, the bank. So I think that whole area of payment acceptance is really the biggest pain point for, for those types of folks. Another one is um, just separating business and, and personal finances. So if you think about categorizing um, transactions on a card so they don't have to save a bunch of receipts at the end of the year to fill out their Schedule C. Um, and, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, you can view your, your business and personal finances in, in different areas. Um, you know, managing contractors, managing the accountant. A lot of times their accountant is uh, doing a lot of the, the financial management work. So I do think they, it's a really unique segment. Um, so I'd love to hear uh, what some of the other folks on the panel are, are, are seeing out there in terms of serving uh, maybe those on kind of on the bottom end of what we would traditionally consider a, a small business. Yeah. I don't know if you know if I would call it the bottom end. And I'll tell you, we run into this all the time with and the banks would surprise you. So I will not share their names, but these are, you know, I won't say they're, they're certainly not money center banks, although because they're, they don't seem to have as much of a concern, but regional, large regional banks, you know, we're talking 50 billion and up in assets, 100 billion and up. They do not have a small business banking platform. Like they're actually coming to us. What they want is, 
And every one of those sole props or even small businesses, they're giving them retail banking. That's their solution. So like that segment of the market, I think is one of the most um, interesting to, you know, to solve the offering for. And I'll tell you, we have, like, we are, we are spending a ton of time at it. You know, we have 250,000 small businesses. Their uh, average monthly revenue, you know, of that population is like around 45 to 50,000 a month. Right. So talking about, you know, $700,000 business, right? Not, not, this is not square. You know what I mean? It's not somebody selling arts and crafts out of the back of their, you know, back of their car, right. Or, or whatever else maybe on the street corner. But the point being is there's money flowing through this thing and they don't have any banking products. And that's the, that's the customer the banks want to keep. And that's what's migrating away from them as your data shows, right? Because, you know, I'll keep my checking, but maybe I'll do something else with QuickBooks and because I just need the invoicing thing or, you know, but if I can bring all that together in a bundle, that's, that's what I really want. Um, and, you know, that I'll tell you, we're like, we're launching a product. We already coming out of beta. It's designed for that. It's acquiring and a bank account linked together. You can write checks, make purchase on debit card, even make virtual card payments, one spot. You know, um, for the very reason you just outlined. Yeah, I'll just add that there are so many businesses being created all the time. And the I think small business banking is such an acquisition game compared to consumer banking. Just because there's so many new businesses, you have to determine which ones are going to grow, which ones have the most potential, which ones you can serve based on whatever your specialty is as a provider. And I do think um, there's a role for you know both fintechs and and banks to uh, say, hey, we can really help you understand when you can up when you need to upgrade to. And oftentimes it's one product. It's maybe you need immersion services, but you don't necessarily uh, need other types of products, or maybe you need point of sale or um, you know a, a business credit product, a business credit card. Oftentimes it's like one product saying, hey, here's a specific financial need that we can help you with getting in and then saying, hey, we have all these other small business products as well. So I do think there's a, a pretty uh, important role for the bank that I'm not seeing out there today, banks and credit unions saying amongst their bus their um, consumers that may be running small businesses, maybe freelancing, maybe growing, helping them understand um, when they can upgrade and why they should upgrade. Yeah, somebody, uh, yeah. in, the, in the questions brought up gig workers too, right? It's just, mm -hmm. I'll say gig and also like influencers. Do you know how... This this number is going to shock you. The gate the the influencer market today, and this is coming from one of the networks estimates, four trillion dollars, and it's like unbanked, completely unbanked. Yeah, no, it's it's a we, we have a client that that is actually um, focused on that space, but but again, I, I think this is to me having conversations with Visa, MasterCard, Amex on these things, like on the side, I, I've joked, but not and say, I do think it's time, you know, from their perspective and then us as banks and then fintechs that we create a separate categorization of products that are specifically to this audience, because there is, there's issues with commercial when you do here, when, you know, you just, you have a, you just went out and got an LLC in Delaware, and then you're trying to open a commercial checking account. Well, good luck, right? In some places, they're not, they're going to think there's something sketchy going on. KYB is almost impossible. You're a new business. But then at the same time, you're going in the consumer realm. It's not providing you with the tools you need. There has to be, um, I think, a category. And, and I think like, Tom basically just said, like, look at the amount of money, right? That's that's just with influencers. I mean, you talk about freelancers, you talk about gig workers. I mean, it's I mean, it's what like you know, a third of of the account of the of the workers in some way are doing something. So or whatever that number was, I, I think that that's important for us to we have to solve for that, in in my opinion. Hundred percent. Well, and that's that's a great segue for the final section of the panel today, which is the future of embedded finance. And uh, when it, it comes to innovations on the horizon, I would like to take a futuristic view here. What are the next innovations that you are seeing in the finance? I know, Anthony, we talked in the past about business banking in a box, for example. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a very old school term, but 
But basically, I mean, what we just talked about is exactly all the stuff we were just talking about, right? Right. Like tying and acquiring to issuing to everything, like creating kind of like what I say is the whole ecosystem, right? And being able to provide that in an easy way is going to be where we, we what we need to do, right? Because, you know, while niche solutions are great and they solve one problem, they're not going to solve for the three, five, other 10 other problems, right? That's a small business needs from a financial perspective. So I think that that to me is like coming up with and how do we bring together and integrate these things in a good way, you know, are going to be the way, are going to be the winners, right? In the space, because it's going to lead to retention. It's going to lead to loyalty and also it keeps your money within your system. You know, I, I think that that's the key thing. And, and without using other terms like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm joking about AI. I'm gonna say, no, but I mean, I think open banking, right? The term open banking, which is a whole other topic, but I think that it kind of ties in here where, you know, all of this kind of talk about open banking and everything else, right? That's another innovation where it's not very innovative in a sense that, but, but it's really creating the ecosystem to support it. Let me say is where the innovation is going to come. How do we put it at, at a point of sale, but also from a bank, you know, business perspective, receiving payments, Fed now, RTP, right? We still have pushed a cart. So it's like, how do we use what we have again, creatively cr putting it together and, and solving what I say, don't use products themselves don't solve problems. Multiple products do, right? If there's no silver bullet. So, so it's really kind of, to me, the innovation is going to be who can package this the right way and who can make this a great user experience. Right, that's going to be a, a huge winner. Anybody else want to yeah. weigh in on that? Go ahead. I mean, I would hate to have to be, you know, redundant, but I mean that that is that is just a fact, right? Business businesses, like every one of them, would like faster access to their cash flow, right? Accelerated cash flow, and be able to optimize working capital. Okay, I don't care how big your business is; that's what you want. Well. Solutions that deliver that. And I think that is not, you can't deliver that sequentially, right? The whole thing about real-time payments, okay? And this is, this is I'll say, this is where the challenge is for banking. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think they'll solve it. And this is where the big opportunity for embedded finance is. Really, all we're talking about is, again, speed. We're talking about speeding everything up. Banks live in a temporal world. Money moves on cut times and, you know, and through a, a sequence and a process. All right, if you could eliminate all that, that's that's the winner, in my mind. That's the winner. And then you just bring features that are, by the way, feel very familiar to you. I just want to get my money in my account faster. And when I do, I'd love to use my debit card to spend. Or if my customer will take a credit card, could I just issue them a single-use virtual card? and they process it and they get paid and I get some cash back, that would be cool. And if I want a loan, could someone be looking at my cash flow and say, hey, you qualified for a $10,000 line of credit. Congratulations, do you want it? Oh, I don't want 10, I want five. Okay, great, here's your five, five's left over for you, right? These are all things, this is what banks do, but enabling that in a bundle, right? That's That to me is like, you know, I'm. I'm hoping Anthony's right because that's exactly what we're building. So, but to me, that is like that's like an elegant experience. And by the way, that doesn't disintermediate banks. I actually think it protects banks because it's like, guys, it, you could just use this and then keep the money with you. It's just stop making it all these friction points where I need all these different accounts. Just give them a modern ledger where it's an account and here's all the things that are within your account, right? And that's what, you know, the tech's there to do that with some really good people, not just priority, like some really, really good folks. So. Thanks a lot, Tom and Anthony. Um, there's another question in the chat box along this line, which is, is the future about restoring full service banking as we had back in the 70s and before when the banker knew your family, your business, but for the community, is that the future? Is it space for that? I'll, yeah, I'll, I can answer this. I, I think definitely, but it's going to look different, obviously. You can't have a conversation with someone every day. You have to, I think, think of ways to have digital conversations on a daily basis. So we talk about like a 15 minutes over coffee approach within digital banking, saying, hey, here are the things that you need to be paying attention to as a business owner. Um, 
you know, you have outstanding invoices that you might need to collect on, or you have a payment due, or you have maybe um, a payment that went out that looks fraudulent, or you have some access that looks fraudulent or something like that, really surfacing, having a conversation, saying these are the things we need to do, and then you can go about um, running your business. So, and then I do think, you know, there is going to be more from business owners, um, more hunger for human to human interaction, as long as they're getting kind of like the, at least as long as they see an industry um, uh, expertise there, as long as the folk, folks understand their business. But I think AI is going to really um, allow bankers to um, make that much more efficient and manage that much more efficiently. So, I, I you know, I think it's on the digital side, making those conversations more personal and also um, using AI in the back end to, um, you know, make yourself more efficient as a human human interaction. I want to t- tap tap onto that because, and I I don't know that I agree with your your what your that that absolutely we're going back to full service banking. There's so many niche solutions in the ecosystem of data. Think about Plaid, right? And how I, it doesn't this isn't particularly involved into the into the 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 B two B game, but that's inevitable that the the ecosystem of payments allows different niche providers to be able to specialize and be excellent at their certain components of it. And so the need and demand for a single, a single entity providing every last benefit is going to become less and less competitive. The more, the more, but the more these specialized different services can continue to integrate and feel centralized. Um, And yeah, I, it took 58 minutes into the session till someone said AI. Thank you, I, Ian, because because that that <laughs> and, and I'm no expert. I but maybe we have this conversation in a year and we see how the evolution of, of AI comes into play here because it's got tremendous opportunities, it's got tremendous risks that are tied to it and how that's going to evolve. If anyone tells you how AI is going to evolve in the payment space, they're lying. They don't know. They're guessing. Um, but there's, it's fun to talk about. Uh, anyway, I, I digress. But I, again, my, my point, I, I, I don't see, I see, I see AI being a good way to make it feel personal and to get that personal touch for small businesses in the banking world. But to the same point, I I I have a hard time envisioning a world where a sing where you've got a single centralized entity that's covering all your needs. No, that's a great point, Tom. And I think um, you know we we heard about AI um, in the survey. Obviously, we're talking about AI all the time. AI has been around for years in technology and in payments, but it's been mainly with structured data or machine learning. Now we're talking about how you can use unstructured data to unlock and augment productivity and improve uh, efficiency. So to your point, we'll have a session, a future panel on AI alone. I work on already to join later on, but definitely you hit a nail on the head there. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, one is, uh, from Elizabeth. I think as long as the SMBs can get their products and services they need with speed, there's not much need of human interaction. So people usually use eight to 12 APIs. Oh, that's a comment, sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Over the top. Appreciate it. Gonna... Um, another question for Gina here was, are you expecting the number of banks that offer BAS to shrink? I know we talked about something about late, earlier, but order of magnitude, how many FIs, any thoughts on that? I think they will. I, I, it's happening already. I mean, we've it's already you know, it's begun. Like, yeah. The, yeah. you know, yeah. the, the, the biggest, I'll say that I don't want to, you know, like the, you know, the rock like hit the water and now the ripples are, you know, are extending They're you know, the, the ones that were closest to the epicenter of that falling are they're they're done. And now it's gonna just kind of course its way out. It's gonna hit some folks to the periphery, you know. Um no doubt about it. Um awesome. The final question that I had here, um, 
was on expansion beyond financial services. And we kind of talk about non-payment companies using tech available today to get into payments, Shopify, for example. Um, how can embedded finance solutions incorporate non-financial services? I think what you're talking about is like adjacent services, right? They're not embedded, but they're they're like Correct. adjacent, right? Correct. And look, I, I think those, you know, like that's been around forever, right? It's called a marketplace. So that's probably not going away. I mean, that I think these look these these uh, opportunities just get get better. It's, um, you know, I want to maybe comment on something that that Tom said uh, about like Plaid, right? They're a niche player in an ecosystem. They do something, they do a particular service really, really well. And yeah, there's always going to be a home for that, right? Because why would I rebuild that? Because they just do that really well. Just use that, right? And I'll use that service. Here's where I think, like, when you're starting to look at things, you got to consider, like, who owns the front end? Who owns the customer relationship, right? And that, that to me, like that's where this bundling of like embedded services and adjacent services can can really take unique shape. You got to own the last mile of distribution to that audience. If you do, you're gonna you're gonna play it one way, right? If you don't, right, and you're a utility to players operating there. By the way, both are really successful business models or could be, can be. Just a matter of like, hey, what's your, you know, what's your interest? What's your passion? Um, so, you know, I think that's the, that's kind of the cool thing about this ecosystem is because it's modernized in so many ways through APIs and, you know, and, and niche services, like you just, you can get up and running fast, not have to, you know, you don't have to be IBM, right? I don't have to build the whole damn stack, right? I can just build the pieces that really make sense for my customer. And then I can call out the utility for things that I don't want to reinvent because somebody does it really well. That person. I, I, so I, I, I can't add on too much more than what Tom's saying, but I'll kind of sum it all up to say, focus on the solution or focus on the problem to find a solution. Don't start with a solution and find a problem. There's problems and there's, there's so many problems to solve that when you look at it through payments, understanding the current modern FinTech ecosystem and the banking environment that where scalable, integratable, sustainable solutions can be made. Um, just takes a, a understanding the problem is where the the process needs to start. I'll, I'll also add that um, just to remember that most business owners are, are, are not fluent in banking and payments mm -hmm. language. Like um, most of them don't have internal financial expertise, helping them understand their cash flow, helping them understand the um, implications of borrowing decisions, really taking kind of a financial health um, lens to a certain extent to your services, I think can really um, add value as well. Thanks a lot, Ian. Um, really before... I'll tell you, somebody else asked the I'm question about, like that 1970s, like, hey, is it gonna, are we going to go back to this? It's actually kind of a neat thought because it's kind of like, well, in a sense, what we're saying is yes. It's just it's going to be delivered through a different application than your community banker, you know, greeting you at the door mm -hmm. and saying, Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Let me help you fill out your application for your, you know, small business loan, right? But it is kind of like curated experience is kind of what we were talking about, which is it's actually kind of a neat concept. I, I, I like the, the notion of that um, for uh, who brought it up. I think it was Philip. Is that right? Yeah, Philip yeah. Andrew.